So when we work with language technologies, we need language recordings, we need language data to work with. In a lot of the, uh, what people call the low resource language technology space or the endangered language technology space, they um, working with languages of, of the world's 7,000 or 8,000 languages. Um, some of them are spoken and taught from the speaking generation or the speaking signing generation, the language use generation being taught to children. And a, a lot of those languages are not. So we talk about the endangered languages being the languages that are not being taught from the generation of language users to the generation of language learners. So the, um, in this case, in, in this photograph here, the top right of screen, Lizzie Ellis is a language uh, user from South Australia, Northern Territory, West Australian border area in the desert country there, uh, Pindjara, Yakinjara country. And she, she's, teaching some children her language uh, through the format of a game, actually. Um, so here we see some language transfer happening, so some language teaching, and we and some of the other activities that are being represented here on the bottom left is a group of uh, young Gurindji women and Professor Felicity Meekins from the University of Queensland. They're documenting language, and it looks like they're making a poster book uh, again to be used in teaching language. Some of the other activities um, down the bottom right we see a very typical fieldwork uh, linguistics language documentation activity happening where the the linguist is sitting in the middle and in front of her she has a list of things that she wants to be recorded and there's a audio recorder on the table it looks like a zoom a very common uh, fairly cheap but reasonably good quality audio recorder and there are two participants who will be recording speaking into that machine and later on that linguist will go and transcribe that recording laboriously. There are many reasons for documenting language including creating resources for language learning um, simply for recording language for future generations or for providing evidence for research. So historically, this field work has been conducted by a researcher from a community outside the studied language group and they systematically analyzed this language and a criticism of the field is that this has tended to be without deep knowledge of people in the context of that language. There has been a really strong focus on the production of texts and research outputs without much consideration of the language communities themselves. There's some links here for the reading. Uh, again, Professor Meekins and Jenny Green and Miff Turpin's book, Understanding Linguistic Fieldwork, is a recent text which does consider the impact of the fieldwork activity on the language community or the, the language users themselves. And there are a few other links there that go into a bit more detail about the process of linguistic fieldwork. So this is a typical way that the language recordings are created for then doing things like now machine learning. Mm. Now, Martin Nakara responds to this criticism of, uh, or the response to this paradigm of linguistic fieldwork by rejecting the way that this is traditionally done. And we're seeing this more now that uh, where language communities, uh, language users themselves are being more responsible, uh, more able and to do research themselves then it's a much more connected research process and it's a much more kind of grounded way of documenting language. So this is a really dense topic. Um, 
maybe might even be worth talking through some of this in the Slack channel uh, over the next week or so. And the text, the book here, Dis Disciplining the Savages, Savaging the Disciplines is uh, Nakata's uh, book about how this method of linguistic um, documentation could be um, kind of upgraded. So Nakata says that people are being heard, their language is being recorded, but they're not being listened to. So wherever possible, if we're working with language technologies, it's important to listen to the people whose language we're working with and not do things to language, but do things with people with their language. There's some really fabulous projects happening in Australia in recent years. Uh, some links here uh, around Australia language centres, uh, community organisations which do language learning, language teaching, language documentation, uh, language archiving projects. And one of the language centres up north, the Nukuru Language Centre, has been doing some fabulous filmmaking projects with, with uh, the uh, ways of passing on that language from the language user generation to the language learners. Again, Bama Language Centre up North Queensland, uh, some great language technologies, including some augmented reality uh, uh, views of or ways of working with language in augment, augmented reality tech. And again, we can look at that in coming weeks. And the Language Documentation and Conservation Journal is a great place to go for articles about how this practice of language fieldwork, language documentation is changing to be more inclusive of the language communities. So we saw in those photographs earlier that uh, digital recording devices are making it uh, very easy to record languages. Uh, so compared to 50 years ago, the process of recording language has become so cheap and easy that piles of the stuff just uh, accumulates. And there are other approaches as well using web-based technologies for documenting language. And these are interesting ways of seeing crowdsourced language recordings made, and especially at a scale which is required for machine learning. When we record language and we document language, it's also important to record the metadata, the data about the data. So who spoke, what was the language, where was it made, and so on. And so this becomes quite useful when we're setting up our language technologies, when we're doing training. Um, it helps to discover or to find languages or language material in the archives. And I had an example uh, just recently where I was, was training a transcription system and within the corpus, within the recorded, all the documentation, all the data was a mixture of adult speakers and children speakers. And I knew that I would get better results if I would, would work just with the adult speech because the children's speech is too much variety in it for the system to learn. And fortunately, there was a metadata, a spreadsheet with the file names and an indication of the age of the speaker. So I was able to easily isolate the adult speech and then train the system just on that. So metadata, uh, there's lots of benefits of having good metadata for the recordings that we work with. We talked about this before, transcription being the process of writing a text version of some other language modality. And there are a couple of different tools that people typically use for doing this. And it's renowned as being a really slow process. So digital recording equipment, you could, in a day, you could record nine hours of people speaking language. The process, the amount of time that it takes to transcribe that, to generate that text format varies and it depends on the the fluency in the language of the person who's doing the transcribing it de depends on the complexity of the language that's being used um, the quality of the recording these are all factors that impact how hard it is to 
listen to what's being uh, listen or look at what's being communicated and then the process of typing it up so we did a survey a few years back where the average uh, time taken to record it was, on average it took 40 minutes to transcribe one minute of audio so you can imagine that over a recording activity that might be a few months worth of uh, of recording it could take years to transcribe that and then that's even before the point of getting onto those subsequent um, processes of glossing translating and analysis there are a few links there to uh, demonstrate the transcription activity and some videos of people using elan which is a popular transcription tool and some tutorial steps if you wanted to get an ex a feel for this yourself go through those um, those elan activities so once this material has been recorded and enriched with the annotation uh, then it's typically archived and either put into some sort of storage mechanism uh, hopefully to be retrieved at a later point so the world uh, there are many different archives around the world uh, OLAC is a global network of catalogs so there's a common data format a common metadata format that allows the metadata to be shared in between these these big archives and within Australia there we have the Paradisic archive um, and the IATSIS archive are two of the big ones also the National Library of Australia has some pretty fascinating language materials so across all of these different digitization or these recording techniques and the documentation annotation techniques you can imagine that there are a lot of different file formats uh, involved and so it becomes a challenge when working with language technologies to be able to convert in between different file formats or different uh, yeah different different formats without losing information and a traditional pathway of going from elan transcription to flex glossing uh, was notorious for losing uh, data losing metadata or losing annotation data about the original recordings so this is something as technologists again we need to consider um, effective ways of converting in between uh, formats in that we don't lose information so thinking about this in review of this uh, section the quality of the recordings that we work with is critical um, low quality recordings tend to be unusable for language technologies that is often too, just too much uh, the, the signal to noise ratio we talk about and again we'll go into this in more detail in future modules if the recordings are too noisy they may just not be usable by the technology regardless of how rare or important the language or the communication that has been recorded is so we see that a fair bit that it might be the last speaker of a language uh, but the recordings may not be usable by language technologies because they're uh, recorded in too noisy a mode or the uh, maybe even the format is inaccessible due to age or technology obsolescence um, some memories of working on a language documentation project a few years back where we were sitting in a tin shed in a monsoon on the side of an airstrip and the, we still went through the process of documenting the language or doing the recording even though we knew we wouldn't be able to use those recordings for anything any kind of automatic processing because the noise they were just too noisy with the sound of the rain and the sound of the airplanes landing there are oh, and in the breaks between the rain and the cicadas uh, but it was still an important activity to record that so when we're doing language documentation we need to consider the the purpose of doing the recording 